Okej, då tänker jag att vi kör igång. Vi kommer nog droppa in lite fler personer här under tiden. Men eh, vi har eh, en, en rejäl föreläsning som vi ska få ta del av. Så jag tänker att vi kör igång helt enkelt. Så hej och välkomna till det här seminariet om hur kroppen påverkas av den kroniska inflammation som HIV orsakar. Jag heter Ronja Sannastotter och jag jobbar på Positiva gruppen. Och det här seminariet kommer att hållas på engelska, så jag kommer strax byta språk. Men vi har tolk till svenska under hela seminariet. Så den som vill kan då trycka på den här knappen som finns längst ner i panelen för zoomfönstret. Och där står det interpretation, det är den här lilla globen, jordgloben. Om man trycker på den så kan man aktivera simultan översättning till svenska. Så välj då svenska om det är det man vill få webbinariet översatt till helt enkelt. Så klickar man på den så får man allt som är på engelska till svenska. Så, det går också bra att skicka in frågor under hela webbinariet. Men vi kan spara dem till slutet. Vi har ungefär 20 minuter efter föreläsningen där vi kommer att dra igenom frågorna. Så skicka i Q&A-funktionen eller så kan man då när vi har den här frågestunden begära ordet genom den här raise hand-funktionen så kan man också få ställa sin fråga direkt muntligt till Peter Hunt. Så. Men som sagt, vi sparar dem till slutet. And now I will switch to English. So today's lecture will be held by Peter Hunt, who is a professor of medicine at University of California, San Francisco. And he is also a co-director of uh, the Center for AIDS Research for Basic and Translational Science connected to the university. His uh, primary research focus is uh, on the inflammatory consequences of the HIV infection. In April this year, participants uh, from Positiva Gruppen or representatives uh, participated in the international workshop on HIV in women, uh, which was organized by Virology Education. And they were very excited to hear about the Peter Hunt's research that was presented there. And many women living with HIV in Sweden uh, have also shown great interest in Peter Hunt's work. And uh, that is why Positiva Gruppen and the Knowledge Network for Women Living with HIV in Sweden have invited him to lecture for us today. So uh, the program for the evening will be as follows. After this introduction, uh, Peter will lecture for about 45 minutes and then we will have a 10 minute break. And after the break, we will have this uh, Q&A session for about 20 minutes before we wrap up the seminar. But before we start, before leaving the, the word to Peter Hunt, I would like to uh, play a short greeting and also introduction from Jane Kidandi Stenberg, who is part of the project group for Knowledge Network uh, for Women Living with HIV. Uh, unfortunately, Jane couldn't attend today, so that is why she recorded this message. So we will start it now. Hello, Peter. Welcome. We're all really glad to have you here with us this evening. My name is Jane, and I'm a representative member of the Knowledge Network for women living with HIV. The Knowledge Network for Women Living with HIV, or Kunskapsnetverket, as it's called in Swedish, was started in 2015 as a conduit for transmission of knowledge from the outside to women living with HIV in Sweden through the gathering and this dissemination of information from conferences, other international organizations, lectures, workshops, etc. Women living with HIV in Sweden also use this project to discuss the issues that are most pertinent to them. I have been positive since 1993 but didn't start on retrovirals till about 23 years ago when I had my last bomb. Um, I've been on the same medicine since. The reason that we have chosen this topic is because 
a great number of us, so-called old timers, have been experiencing a lot of inflammation in the body. We don't know if this is as a result of us being HIV positive or if it's a side effect of the medicines that we take. We all of course have different medicines and we are aware that they affect us differently. I have been using or have been on Viramune and Quevexa for the last 23 years. We have of course tried talking to our doctors about the inflammation problems that we have, but we haven't gotten much help from there. Our medical system today is such that we have to go to the clinics as our primary caregivers and only meet our HIV doctors once a year for a complete, uh, for a complete review of our status. And unfortunately, the doctors at the clinics are not really conversant with um, a lot of the aspects of HIV or the long-term effects, effects of it. We would like to know what causes inflammation in the body and if there is any way of countering this. Does the inflammation get worse the older we become? I recently read somewhere that intermittent fasting could be a good way to reduce inflammation in the body. True or false? Don't know. I guess I'll stop here now, as I know that the ladies are impatient to hear what you have to say. And thank you again for being with us tonight. And welcome. Thank you so much, Jane. And with that, I leave the word to you, Peter Hunt. Welcome. Oh, well, thank you for such a lovely introduction. And, and thank you, Jane, really, uh, for a really thoughtful um, uh, opening. And hopefully I'll address uh, a lot of the questions that you asked. Um, uh, and, I, and hopefully um, uh, the, my lecture today will help empower you uh, and other women living with HIV in Sweden uh, to have discussions with your doctors about you know, things that you can do now and potentially uh, in the future uh, to help reduce um, inflammation uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and the risk of age-related uh, diseases. So um, here are my conflicts of uh, interest uh, disclosures. Now to uh, set Peter, this, yes. I'm sorry, but uh, this, uh, it's not the presentation view, it's your uh, note view. So perhaps you could try oh, sharing this. How about, how, about, how about this? Uh, does that, um, do you see the, the no, full we, screen we, now? We still see the notes view hmm. huh. could you try sharing let it me, again we have, we have had let this. me stop yeah let me stop the sharing and then um let me try again let's see okay what, what do you see now now i just see the the like powerpoint uh okay view, but not yeah press yeah the and then how about how about now no we still see the notes view notes. yeah um and then let me swap displays and now do you see yeah no okay now it works no, now okay. It looks okay good great Thank okay you. all right so everything i just said before <laughs> just, you can um yeah so i um yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you again uh, for uh, the invitation to speak with you. And thank you again, Jane, uh, for such a lovely um, uh, welcome message. Uh, and I hope to address many of these issues in, in the talk um, uh, and hopefully to empower you and other women with HIV in Sweden to have discussions with your doctors uh, about uh, these issues. So. 
and and these were my conflicts of interests. So why are we focused on inflammation in HIV? Uh, well, we know that the life expectancy gap uh, for people living with HIV is narrowing. Uh, so for your average 20-year-old uh, uh, um, in the general population uh, in, in the United States, they can expect to live on average a little more than 60 more years into, into their 80s. Um, and that's uh, uh, people without HIV in the general population. And you can see that the life expectancy for a 20 year old with HIV in red, this lower line in the triangles uh, is lower. Um, uh, but over the last uh, uh, decade or so, uh, the life expectancy has been improving. Um, so uh, the life expectancy you know, gap uh, compared to the general population is now um, uh, just nine years. Uh, so that's um, uh, far better than it used to be, but it's still uh, a shorter life expectancy uh, than the general population. Now, for people with HIV who start uh, antiretroviral therapy or the HIV meds, uh, at uh, 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 very early in, in the course of their HIV infection, when their CD4 count uh, is very high, um, that gap uh, narrows uh, to only about six years. Um, but um, if you look at other diseases that are normally associated with the aging process, so problems with liver disease, kidney disease, lung disease, diabetes, cancer, or cardiovascular disease, all of those are uh, increased uh, in people with HIV, particularly as they get older. And um, if you look at um, um, uh, you know, the, the years free of these diseases, um, uh, people without HIV uh, in blue, um, or, or go another 15 years um, uh, without experiencing uh, one of these diseases uh, as compared to people with HIV. So people with HIV are getting aging related diseases on average about 15 years earlier than people without HIV. Um, and this gap um, uh, shortens a little bit uh, for people who start their HIV medications at a high CD4 count above 500 um, uh, to about 10 years, uh, but there's still a substantial gap that remains. And when people start HIV uh, medications at even later disease stages, um, when the CD4 count is below say 350, um, there's an even greater you know, gap in life expectancy. So um, uh, there's a, about a 20 year uh, 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 reduction in life expectancy for people who start at low CD4 counts. And this is uh, really important because um, of, the of the over 20 million people around the world who are currently receiving HIV medications. Um, the vast majority started at a lower CD4 count, you know, below 350. So um, we're going to be dealing with um, uh, these issues for a very long time uh, uh, around the world um, uh, um, uh, because um, uh, th there is likely to be a shorter life expectancy in these individuals. And uh, people with HIV um, uh, who, um, uh, despite uh, the HIV medications and suppressing their, uh, their viral load, um, who don't restore a normal CD4 count during therapy are at particularly high risk. Um, so um, this is a, a large international study that looked at this uh, question um, uh, across multiple continents uh, uh, in, in the world, um, um, tens of thousands of patients uh, contributing. And they, they, they followed people who um, uh, had started HIV medications uh, at a low CD4 count below 200, but then uh, achieved and maintained a suppression of the viral load to undetectable levels uh, for three years um, 
Uh, so they really fully suppress the virus on their medications. Um, uh, but um, uh, a fraction of them, uh, about 15%, uh, never really got a CD4 count increase uh, above 200, um, uh, and 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 people who who didn't get that uh, large CD4 increase um, had the highest mortality rate. So um, uh, two and a half uh, uh, percent um, uh, died uh, every year, um, and over the course of a decade, that's um, 25 uh, percent um, uh, mortality over over 10 years. So People who have um, uh, uh, um, a low uh, CD4 recovery during uh, HIV medications um, are particularly high risk. Um, uh, uh, um, and, and this is also true for uh, heart disease and cancer. Um, in fact, uh, the majority of the deaths uh, in this group uh, of people um, we're from not uh, not we're not from AIDS, um, so not from uh, uh, having a weak immune system and and, and uh, infections, uh, but they were from non-AIDS causes of death like heart disease and cancer, um, and very similar causes of death to people who restored normal T cell counts. And so. Uh, several um, uh, aging-related diseases are increased in people with HIV. These include um, cardiovascular disease, non-AIDS cancers, osteoporosis or bone fractures, um, lung disease uh, like emphysema and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, liver disease, kidney disease, uh, cognitive uh, decline, so difficulties with memory, um, uh, infections from uh, uh, not necessarily AIDS causes, but um, just typical pneumonia um, uh, that can affect um, uh, people without HIV. Uh, these infections are increased in people with HIV. Um, uh, one of the leading causes of blindness, um, uh, macular degeneration, um, also appears to be increased uh, uh, somewhat in people with HIV. Um, and then lastly, this uh, condition uh, uh, called frailty, um, which is a, a, a problem of, with functional status. Um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and difficulty in responding to uh, and recovering from uh, 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 health um, problems like, if you get admitted to the hospital, it takes you a much longer time to recover um, uh, uh, from, from that um, uh, illness um, if you're frail um, as compared to if you were not frail. So these functional status problems um, uh, can, uh, uh, are increased in people with HIV, particularly those who started uh, HIV medications later in the disease uh, course. And so why is all of this happening? Um, uh, in, the, in the past, uh, we've focused a lot on specific side effects of HIV medications. Um, as Jane alluded to, um, you know, there, are, you know uh, there have been concerns about uh, potential side effects of the medications. I, I will say that um, with most of our modern HIV medications, um, uh, there are far fewer side effects uh, than there used to be. Um, uh, and so I think that most of the um, uh, aging related complications that we're seeing are not necessarily due to the HIV drugs, um, um, even though there continue to be studies um, looking at differences between HIV drugs on, infl on inflammation and aging. I don't think that that's a a primary, um, you know, driver uh, right now. Um, in the past, um, some of the earlier drugs like AZT and um, D4T, um, DDI, uh, these are um, these drugs uh, had, and some of the earlier protease inhibitors. These drugs had did have a lot of side effects um, uh, that contributed to disease, but um, but we don't use those uh, medications uh, uh, much anymore, and so. Uh, most modern um, uh, uh, drugs uh, tend not to have those side effects. Um, 
And um, of course, lifestyle factors are important. Um, and um, uh, 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 there are many people with HIV who may um, um, uh, uh, use uh, alcohol or uh, injection drugs, uh, uh, or, uh, or, or maybe more likely to smoke cigarettes. Um, and all of those things can contribute to aging related complications too. Um, but many of us have focused on this concept that Jane introduced uh, of inflammation. Um, uh, uh, and uh, let me tell you why um, uh, we think that's important in HIV. It, it turns out that, um, so inflammation is um, the body's response um, to an infection uh, or a damage in the body. If you imagine if you um, bang your thumb with a hammer um, by accident, um, your thumb gets painful, red, and swollen, right? And um, that process is inflammation. Um, that's your body responding to the injury and trying to repair it. Um, um, now that also happens when you get an infection, your immune system responds to the infection by causing inflammation, trying to resolve it. Um, uh, and in HIV, that same thing happens. Um, your body's immune system responds, um, uh, but it's not like, uh, hitting your thumb, uh, with a hammer where you can actually see the inflammation there. Um, uh, it's um, a, a lower level of inflammation uh, but throughout the body. Um, uh, uh, it's so low that you don't have a fever, you don't see redness or swelling necessarily, um, but it's a low level of inflammation throughout the body uh, that over time uh, takes its toll on the various uh, organs in the body um, uh, and can contribute uh, to chronic diseases uh, associated with the aging process. And so we know that um, uh, specific markers of inflammation, so these are blood tests that we can measure in the laboratory, uh, uh, like uh, uh, IL-6, uh, that's a, a particular inflammatory uh, cytokine, uh, that's a, a, an inflammatory signal, if you will, in the immune system uh, that goes up with uh, inflammation. We know that this is elevated uh, in people with HIV uh, compared to people without HIV. Um, and it remains elevated, um, uh, albeit at lower levels, um, uh, during uh, HIV therapy uh, when we suppress the virus. Um, uh, but those who have the highest levels of IL-6, and that would be the people in the, you know, in the top uh, quartile, a quartile is the top 25% uh, of people of uh, 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 IL-6 levels, um, if you're in that high inflammation group, um, you have a 20% chance over the next decade uh, of getting uh, a, a, a significant um, uh, non-AIDS uh, uh, aging related complication like uh, a heart attack, a stroke, um, uh, cancer, uh, et cetera, uh, compared to just 5% chance if you have um, a low level of inflammation. Um, and so, Inflammation really seems to predict um, a lot of these uh, uh, um, uh, diseases that we associate with the aging process. And so our field's goal is really to move people who have uh, in, you know, um, too much inflammation in the body uh, in, the, in, in, these, in these top two groups uh, down to these two groups um, and have lower levels of inflammation and are at lower risk for disease. And what I'll spend the rest of the time talking about uh, today is whether there may be sex differences in inflammation that may be important. And so we know that women uh, have stronger uh, innate immune responses to HIV than men. So what's an innate uh, immune response? Well, um, part of your immune system we call the adaptive immune system that um, uh, that's very specific for a particular type of infection. So we're all used to by now, um, the concept of uh, uh, getting a, a COVID-19 vaccination. Um, and um, those vaccines um, uh, cause, um, uh, uh, induce an immune response in your body uh, 
uh, whenever it sees um, COVID-19. It's very specific for COVID-19 and it does not affect um, uh, um, your risk uh, of any other infection. Um, that's the adaptive immune system. But the innate immune system uh, is the part of your immune defenses that responds right away. It doesn't need to be trained like with a vaccine and it's not specific for any one particular type of infection, um, uh, but it responds right away whenever it senses that uh, um, there may be a, 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 some type of foreign invader uh, like a virus. Um, and um, one, of those, um, one of those types of um, uh, responses uh, uh, is uh, 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 this uh, interferon response. Um, uh, and, um, uh, uh, cells of the innate immune system, like a dendritic cell pictured here. When it sees a virus, uh, it responds strongly by secreting this, this inflammatory uh, product, interferon, uh, which tells lots of other cells to start fighting the virus. And it turns out that uh, we've known for over a decade now that when uh, cells, uh, uh, immune cells uh, uh, from women, um, uh, are presented with um, HIV, they respond uh, more robustly you know, to the HIV than cells from men. Um, uh, and um, we think um, uh, that this is a key reason why women with HIV have lower viral loads than men and higher inflammation at any given viral load uh, than men. Uh, in the absence of um, uh, HIV therapy, um, and um, and this is this has been a paradox that uh, uh, that we've had in the field for many many years that you know that women tend to have lower viral loads than men, uh, yet they uh, progress uh, to AIDS uh, in the absence of therapy at the same rate roughly as men, and um, and this may be one of the reasons why. Uh, that there's more of an inflammatory response to the virus. It helps control the virus on the one hand, but it may also lead to inflammatory consequences on the other hand. And we've learned in the last several years some of the reasons why this may be. Um, you know, what are some of those biologic mechanisms um, by which women have more inflammation when they see HIV than men. And it turns out that one of the key sensors um, of the body uh, that detects viruses uh, is called TLR7, toll-like receptor 7. It's a fancy name. Uh, but this is a key receptor of the innate immune system that responds to viruses. It turns out that this key sensor is encoded on the X chromosome. And so men only have one copy of the X chromosome, right? Uh, um, we're, the, we're the unlucky ones. We only get one, one X chromosome uh, and we have the shorter inferior Y chromosome <laughs> uh, that, uh, uh, you know, in addition, uh, but we only get one copy. And so we get one copy of that uh, innate sensor. And so when cells from men um, uh, see uh, a virus, um, uh, they respond, they only have a little bit of this sensor, and so they have a moderate um, uh, uh, inflammatory response to it. Um, but uh, cells from women um, uh, have more of this sensor because it's on that X chromosome, and they get two copies um, uh, of that sensor. So double, um, uh, double the genetic material to make this, uh, the, this key uh, sensor. Uh, told like receptor seven. And, you know, the body has many ways in women uh, of preventing uh, genes uh, that happen to be on the X chromosome uh, uh, from getting uh, made in, in too much abundance. Um, you could imagine it could be a problem to have um, too much of a, a given protein made. Um, and so there's this system by which um, in most cells in the body, um, one of the X chromosomes in women uh, is inactivated. Uh, so only one of the uh, X chromosomes gets um, uh, uh, expressed. Um, and 
the way this works is there's um, a, a part of, um, there's this uh, inactivation transcript. There's something that's um, made in the X chromosome and it starts out at the center. It's like a little thread that weaves like a little um, blanket, if you will, um, uh, over uh, the entire uh, X chromosome uh, uh, to silence it um, uh, so that only one of the chromosomes is expressed. It turns out that it, it weaves this blanket from the inside out. And so um, it often doesn't get all the way to the, the ends though. Uh, so if you happen to have a gene uh, that is on one of the ends of the X chromosome, it's often you know, not silenced uh, by the blanket. Um, uh, it, it, it remains open and expressed. And so it turns out that toll-like receptor seven just happens to be um, uh, at the end of the chromosome, so often is not silenced. Um, and often women uh, have extra atoll-like receptor 7 expressed uh, in their cells. And as a consequence, when they see the same amount of virus, their cells respond with a much more robust um, uh, interferon response, a much more robust innate immune response. And so we think this is a key uh, mechanism uh, by which uh, women with HIV, you know, have more inflammation than men with HIV when they, when they see the virus. And this really is an interaction with viruses in particular. So um, in women without HIV, we don't really see this, um, uh, these sex differences in inflammation. So this is a study um, uh, from uh, my colleagues in the Africos uh, cohort. This is um, in uh, 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 Eastern, Central, and um, uh, uh, Western Africa, um, where uh, they've enrolled um, uh, people both with and without HIV, uh, and they've looked at a bunch of different inflammatory markers. And so um, to orient you in this graph, um, uh, if, um, if the bars are above this uh, line of, of zero, uh, the, uh, the inflammatory markers are increased in women. And if it's below uh, uh, the line, it's decreased in women compared to men. And so first focusing on people without HIV, you know, they see very little difference um, in, in, in these inflammatory markers between women and men. They have about the same. All these bars are crossing that you know, uh, line of zero. But if you look at people with HIV uh, who are on HIV medications and have a suppressed viral load, you see uh, in the dark blue uh, that several of these inflammatory markers are increased in women compared to men. Uh, and it looks very different um, than we see in people without HIV. So women with HIV have a substantially higher um, uh, levels of um, this interferon response marker, uh, IL, uh, IP10 or CXCL10. Remember, I told you that key mechanism caused more interferon production in women than men. Well, this biomarker is a direct readout uh, of that, in, um, uh, infl that specific inflammatory response. And you see that women with HIV have greater uh, levels of that interferon response than men uh, do. Uh, and then, uh, you see many other uh, inflammatory markers are also increased significantly in women compared to men. Um, all these dark blue lines are above the line. So this is a key interaction between HIV, sex, and inflammation. And several other studies uh, over the years have highlighted um, these important sex differences in inflammation. Now, um, those are mechanisms by which, um, uh, uh, on, on a genetic basis, by which you know, women are primed to respond with more inflammation to HIV than men. Um, but sex hormones also probably play a role. Uh, and, and if anything, the sex hormones, uh, female sex hormones like estrogen, probably suppress inflammation. Um, are, if you think of the, the toll-like receptor seven story I told you on the X chromosome, that's sort of like the foot on the accelerator increases um, 
uh, uh, inflammation. Well, estrogens might be putting, like putting your foot on the brake, uh, suppressing uh, inflammation or modifying that. And um, this is a, a study um, uh, done by colleagues, um, uh, uh, Eileen Skelly, um, uh, 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 in, in the HIV cure um, uh, research world where, um, uh, and John Karn at Case Western. And, and they, were, they were interested in, in whether uh, estrogen might have effects on the expression of HIV in cells uh, from, from the so-called latent reservoir of HIV. Um, and what they showed is that uh, they took cells uh, from uh, um, uh, women uh, uh, in red and cells from men in blue, and they put them in a, a petri dish um, or a cell culture, um, uh, and then they stimulated them uh, to see um, if they could get HIV to be expressed um, uh, out of these cells. Um, and um, in both uh, uh, female cells and male cells, you got some stimulation uh, of, um, uh, of HIV uh, coming out of um, uh, those cells and they're stimulated. Uh, but when they added uh, uh, estradiol or an estrogen, they suppressed uh, uh, all the HIV expression uh, in the female cells. Um, so female cells are responding to estrogen by suppressing uh, HIV reactivation, um, uh, whereas they didn't see that in the male cells. Um, and um, what's more, uh, they went on to show uh, that with um, uh, the amount of HIV that seems to be coming out of cells um, uh, increases with menopause. Um, so presumably after menopause, when you you know, when you lose some um, uh, uh, estrogen production, uh, you now um, uh, allow uh, for more um, uh, HIV to come out of cells um, uh, from women. And so this may be uh, one of the mechanisms by which um, inflammation uh, increases with menopause um, uh, in women with HIV. And, um, and we, we know that HIV continues to be expressed in cells uh, in the body, um, uh, particularly in tissues like the lining of the gut um, uh, has many uh, uh, infected CD4 T cells in people with HIV. And our own group has shown recently that while levels of HIV expression in the lining of the gut go down, uh, uh, when you're treated on um, antiretroviral therapy, um, uh, it remains elevated uh, compared to uh, people without HIV. And the more um, uh, virus is expressed in the lining of the gut, uh, the more markers of inflammation uh, you see uh, in the bloodstream. And so um, this leads us to a theoretical model of, of how we think um, uh, sex uh, and menopause are uh, modifying uh, inflammation in people with HIV. Um, we think that um, uh, pre-menopause, um, uh, women have this uh, increased uh, innate response against the virus, that toll-like receptor seven story, um, uh, but they have um, also uh, estrogens around, which may suppress HIV reactivation and thereby suppressing inflammation. Uh, but post-menopause, as estrogen levels decline, there's less of this break. Um, and so the dominant response is just this inflammatory response to the virus. So uh, we think that that um, may explain why um, uh, inflammation increases with menopause. Um, so do sex differences in inflammation have an impact on the risk of, uh, of, of getting sick uh, from chronic diseases of aging um, uh, uh, and mortality in the setting of treated HIV? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the, um, this description of, the, uh, of, the sci of how the study was um, uh, designed, but just to show you um, uh, that um, we measured a, a bunch of inflammatory markers um, uh, in women and men uh, who were virally suppressed uh, on HIV. And almost all of these markers that we tested were higher in women than in men. Um, so we really do think that um, 
particularly during viral suppression, um, that women have more inflammation than men. Um, and, um, and we also do think that there is this effect of menopause. Um, uh, our cohort had a, a median age of 47, um, which is around the average time that women with uh, HIV experience menopause. Um, women with HIV tend to experience menopause a few years earlier than women without HIV. Um, and so we decided to look to see whether um, uh, age uh, uh, had an effect on uh, a differential effect on inflammation in men uh, versus women with HIV. And so first focusing on men, uh, a lot of these um, uh, 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 inflammatory markers seem to increase um, with older age uh, being above versus below 47 years old. Uh, they, they tended to increase in men. Uh, but if you look uh, among women, uh, uh, going above 47 uh, was associated with a, a much greater increase in multiple markers of inflammation than we saw in men. Uh, so that was a suggestion to us that um, uh, menopause um, uh, may be contributing to a greater level of increase in inflammation in women than men. Uh, and uh, there are uh, recent data uh, published uh, from the WISE uh, cohort in the United States that, that show pretty good evidence um, you, uh, that, that as um, uh, hormonally defined menopause uh, happens, um, uh, that uh, inflammation does go up. And uh, what we showed in our study is that um, these in differences in inflammation probably have an impact uh, on um, the risk of disease. And so if we look at um, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, one type of uh, heart attack uh, or myocard myocardial infarction and uh, mortality or death, um, the relationship between inflammation uh, and these events um, is stronger in women than it is in men. You know, these, uh, this is like a you know, two to fourfold um, uh, uh, increased risk uh, associated with elevations in these biomarkers in women uh, compared to just a one to two percent increase um, in, in, in risk in men. Uh, so that's, um, that suggests to us that these increases in inflammation in women are probably important. We see a similar pattern uh, for ischemic stroke. Uh, so we know that HIV increases the risk of stroke to a greater degree in women than it does in men. Um, and this may be an explanation why uh, that um, these inflammatory markers tend to predict stroke um, uh, more uh, robustly in women uh, than they do in men. Even though our sample size is low, there's a pretty clear pattern here. Um, and um, whereas the opposite is true for other types of complications like venous thromboembolism, that's like getting a blood clot in your leg. Um, um, that um, inflammation seems to predict that complication uh, pretty well in men, uh, but not so well in women. Uh, so um, uh, this is uh, 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 there. There are likely to be important differences in the way that inflammation contributes to disease in women versus men. Um, and sometimes, um, sometimes these differences can be in uh, the complete opposite direction. Uh, so uh, we know that um, one of these inflammatory markers, um, uh, soluble TNF receptor one, uh, is one of the uh, greatest uh, predictors of um, type two diabetes in an earlier study um, uh, uh, published about a decade ago, uh, but it was largely men. There were only you know, 13 women in that study. And it seemed like this particular pathway was really important in predicting diabetes risk. Um, uh, but we, what we've shown in a study with enough women uh, is that that same biomarker actually produce, uh, predicts a decreased risk of type 2 diabetes in women. So there's, there are different inflammatory pathways that are affecting disease risk in women than men. And um, the only way we're going to understand these differences is by studying enough um, you know, women in these studies uh, too often you know, women have been excluded uh, from a lot of uh, research uh, studies uh, in HIV 
And I think we need to change that in order to better understand um, the sex differences uh, and to develop um, therapies that might you know, uh, um, uh, help women in a more targeted way. Um, uh, so what can we do to reduce inflammation to uh, decrease its effects right now? Um, so Jane was asking about this earlier. Um, so there are a few things that we can do. Um, so it's really important uh, to start HIV medications as early as possible in the course of the infection. We know that that will reduce the level of inflammation uh, once uh, a viral suppression is um, maintained. So that's important. Um, uh, better adherence to HIV medications is also important uh, because um, even in people who have an undetectable viral load, uh, um, you know, some people can still have an undetectable viral viral load by not, you know, and, and still not take all of their medications. You know, there's a little bit of wiggle room there. And people who have, you know, uh, who miss more doses of their HIV medications um, will have higher levels of inflammation than people who, you know, take all their doses. And so that's something that people with HIV can do. Um, and now we have uh, better tools uh, to help people who have difficulty taking pills, right? We, there, there are now injectable HIV medications that are becoming available. Uh, and, um, and, and those may uh, uh, help other people maintain uh, viral suppression and reduce inflammation um, uh, uh, for people who have trouble um, ad adhering to pills. Um, moderate exercise um, uh, also has been shown to reduce inflammation. Um, uh, so this is something that we can recommend right now to people um, with HIV, uh, and so does uh, uh, stopping smoking and uh, uh, and uh, and hazardous alcohol use. Um, if you um, if you reduce uh, those things, uh, you will also reduce inflammation in addition to all the other health benefits um, of um, uh, of, uh, of smoking cessation and and uh, alcohol cessation. Um, and then lastly. Um, uh, and this is really for the HIV doctors and the and the general practitioners that may be taking care of people with HIV. You know, treating you know what we call modifiable risk factors, things like high blood pressure, or hypertension, high cholesterol. You know, things that also contribute to disease risk. Um, it's important to manage those. It's really important to manage those in people with HIV because they're at higher risk. Um, so those are all things we can do now. What about the future? Um, well, uh, the, um, the, 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 the next uh, uh, potential intervention to reduce inflammation, I, I think that we'll see uh, maybe the statins. Um, these are cholesterol lowering drugs that also have anti-inflammatory effects. And some early studies by my colleague, Grace McComsey showed that, you know, the uh, statin, resuvastatin uh, reduced uh, uh, inflammation in people with treated HIV. And um, my colleague Janet Lowe uh, also showed that um, a, a torvastatin, a different flavor of statin, uh, reduced um, uh, a, 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 a cholesterol buildup in the arteries um, uh, of, of people with HIV. And so uh, both of these observations led to uh, the, a, a very large clinical study called Reprieve. Um, it's uh, 7,700 7, people around the world um, with HIV who don't otherwise need a statin to lower their cholesterol uh, are, are being given patavastatin or a placebo sugar pill uh, for several years um, to see if it reduces the risk of heart disease, but also other aging related complications. So it's, that trial is fully enrolled and we hope to get um, uh, some results uh, from that in, in the next two years or so. Uh, so that will, you know, if that shows that these statin drugs really does you know, do reduce some uh, disease risk, uh, that'll be a new therapy that we can uh, potentially offer um, uh, to reduce inflammation. And then what about other novel strategies? Um, well, it relates to what's driving inflammation in, 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 in people with um, HIV. And that was another one of Jane's questions. Um, and, and there are several root drivers of inflammation. Um, one is the HIV reservoirs and tissues that I just spoke about. Uh, HIV doesn't go away from the body. Um, 
uh, with HIV medicines. It, it, uh, it, it can come right back once you stop the HIV medicines. And we don't yet have drugs um, uh, that completely eliminate those reservoirs or silence them. Um, and we could really use some of those therapies, uh, but we don't have them yet. Um, another is this process of microbial translocation, which I'll talk about in a second, the so-called leaky gut uh, syndrome. And, and the next is um, co-infections like uh, CMV or cytomegalovirus that most people with HIV have, uh, which might further contribute to inflammation. So here's that leaky gut syndrome I talked about. Um, uh, the cartoon on the top reflects um, uh, the lining of the gut, this little pink ribbon here uh, in, in, in someone without HIV. And um, on the inside, uh, uh, above that ribbon is the inside of the colon, if you will, um, where you have these uh, blue oval-like particles, which are like bacteria uh, in, inside your gut. And um, that lining of the gut uh, keeps all the bacteria from uh, getting inside the body into the bloodstream. Uh, and you have behind that brick wall, um, uh, you have um, a, a lot of uh, uh, parts of the immune system which are keeping um, uh, a bacteria from getting in. And um, in, in, the, in the first few uh, weeks of HIV infection, there are major changes that happen in the lining of the gut. Um, so that brick wall, you get cracks in that brick wall, um, and you also lose um, uh, a lot of the immune system cells that are, um, are preventing bacteria from getting in, uh, CD4 T cells and particular types of CD4 T cells that are important in maintaining uh, the integrity of this uh, brick wall. And um, bacteria can get across and into the bloodstream driving inflammation. And, um, and, and there are cracks in this brick wall that appear as well. And so all this happens in the very first few weeks of HIV infection, and it, um, and it fails to completely normalize um, uh, during antiretroviral therapy. And so uh, until now, we haven't had any therapies uh, that have been shown to um, uh, reverse this process um, uh, in people with HIV. Uh, we've tried Number, a number of different things, nothing has been able to repair that brick wall. Uh, until just earlier this year, uh, my colleague Janet Lowe um, presented this study um, at our retrovirus conference earlier this year, where she used a, a diabetes medicine called a GLP-2 agonist called uh, Tadouglutide. Uh, um, and uh, in addition to its helpful effects for diabetes, this, medic this medication uh, helps uh, uh, gut um, epithelial cells, which are the cells in the lining of that pink ribbon that I showed you. Uh, um, uh, it helps them grow uh, and, um, uh, and it helps them maintain uh, a tight barrier. Um, and so uh, this uh, medicine specifically reduces microbial translocation, this leaky gut syndrome. And what she found is that when people with HIV took this medicine, they had lower levels of inflammation in their arteries, um, which is probably helpful in reducing heart disease risk. They also had reduced uh, immune activation um, uh, uh, in the bloodstream. And, and so all this is really uh, 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 exciting. Um, uh, it's the first time that an intervention to block uh, the, um, uh, the leaky gut um, has actually uh, reduced inflammation in, in people with HIV. Um, but there were uh, lots of tolerability issues with, the, uh, with this medicine. So a lot of people had bloating and gastrointestinal side effects uh, with this medicine. And so, um, uh, so it's not quite ready to uh, be given uh, you know, to people with HIV now. Um, uh, but uh, future studies will hopefully see if um, uh, a lower dose of the drug could be given that might have fewer side effects, um, uh, but still maintain this uh, uh, helpful anti-inflammatory effect. And so um, there's ongoing research in this area. And then um, our own group has been focusing a lot on CMV, um, this virus that um, most people with HIV have uh, that has long been known to be associated with more inflammation. Here's IP10, that interferon response marker I told you about earlier that's higher in women. 
uh, well, CMV, having CMV um, increases um, uh, uh, that inflammatory pathway as well. Uh, and um, uh, we uh, did a study several years ago of this drug valgancyclovir, which suppresses CMV, uh, and, it, and showed that it reduced um, uh, uh, inflammation in the body uh, in, in people with HIV. And so we're, you know, we're now um, enrolling a, a larger study of 180 people with HIV um, uh, to see if uh, suppressing CMV uh, reduces, um, for a longer period of time, uh, uh, reduces uh, inflammation. And a key element of this study is that we're making sure that at least a third of all participants are women. Uh, because um, as I told you, we think that women respond to virus infections with more inflammation. And so we think this intervention by blocking CMV, this other virus, um, might have an even greater anti-inflammatory benefit in women uh, than in men. So we're making extra effort uh, to um, uh, ensure that um, uh, we're having a robust recruitment of women into the study. Uh, so uh, uh, and then lastly, I'll just highlight this. I think this is a question that may have come up. You know, is there anything we can do to measure inflammation um, in the body? Um, I don't currently measure inflammation in, in my own clinic. Um, and that's primarily because we don't yet have proven interventions that uh, reduce both inflammation and, um, and disease. Um, uh, so until the reprieve trial shows us that a medicine like a statin might reduce the risk of disease, you know, I don't have an intervention that I can offer yet um, uh, people who have happen to have higher levels of inflammation. Therefore, I don't necessarily check it, but that may change um, once the reprieve trial gets reported. We may find that it's particularly effective in people who have a certain level of baseline inflammation. And we may need to develop biomarkers that you know, predict um, you know, uh, uh, the, the best response to that medicine. Um, one of the issues though also is that some biomarkers that predict disease fluctuate a lot within individuals. And so it's hard to measure a reliable level of inflammation uh, for an individual person, um, even though in large uh, studies, these markers predict disease. Um, uh, so we need to develop clinically validated cutoffs uh, for these biomarkers if they're to be used in the clinic. So I'll stop by summarizing that inflammation persists in people with HIV despite HIV therapy, and it predicts increased risk of age-related um, uh, diseases. Um, women likely have a more robust inflammatory response to HIV than men. Um, one key factor seems to be the fact that women get two copies of that innate sensor to like receptor seven on their X chromosome. Um, estrogens uh, may moderate this inflammatory response, particularly in women with HIV um, uh, in, the, uh, in premenopausal women. Uh, and um, uh, postmenopausal women may then have higher levels of HIV expression and inflammation. Uh, Sex-related differences in inflammation likely modify the risk of disease in, in people with treated HIV, and this may impact the optimal targets for interventions that we look at in research, as well as um, uh, trying to identify pe the people most likely to benefit from those therapies. And um, to uh, follow up on that, uh, we absolutely need to recruit more women and in, in clinical trials of um, uh, all the studies that we do because women are clearly different than men in terms of the immune response to HIV. And we need to understand that better uh, to come up with the best therapies. Uh, so I'll stop by acknowledging uh, my laboratory and then all the people that uh, collaborated uh, with me on uh, these related issues as well as um, uh, uh, some colleagues like Eileen Skelly, uh, at Johns Hopkins, uh, who's uh, really a, 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 a world leader in sex differences in HIV, who shared some slides uh, uh, with me uh, for this. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. And I guess we've got a break uh, and, then, um, uh, and then questions later. Yeah, that's true. And thank you so much, Peter, for, for such an interesting lecture on a very important topic, uh, super interesting really. And yes, we're having a short break and I think we'll have 
uh, eight minutes actually to have some time for the questions. So we see you back at uh, 10 past seven then. So eight minutes break. Thank you. Okay. Okay, welcome back from the break. And we have got some questions. Uh, I think we'll start with the, those who raised hand during the lecture. Uh, I think Kia uh, raised a hand. If you you have lowered it, but if you want to ask your question, you're you're able to do that now. We'll, we will allow you to talk. And I can, I, I think you're muted right now. So if you want to ask your question, you have to unmute your. Okay. We'll wait a few seconds. Okay, so I think we will go to the next question then. And that is from Apostolos and I, I think now you're able to ask your question if you like. You're... Yeah. Oh, yeah. welcome. Thank you basically so much for this. Uh, Peter, thank you so much actually for this super nice uh, presentation. I think that actually you covered uh, pretty much a big, um, yeah, you covered basically a lot regarding inflammation. Um, I would like to ask you a couple of questions that actually I have here. So, well, okay, just to comment uh, to the people that 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 also uh, are basically here. So, so uh, well, most of the studies that you presented in the beginning, and they talk basically regarding the age-related diseases have been contacted um, with people taking older drugs. And these, of course, are, are, are uh, highly associated with higher uh, body toxicity as well, right? So I would basically say, as a non-expert in, in this field. I would basically say that also drug toxicity uh, would be highly related, well, called um, associated, let's say, uh, with the with higher inflammation markers. Uh, what would you say regarding this? And then based on this, I would like to <coughs> ask you a question regarding your, your last pub publication so um yeah so please yeah it's a it's a great question um the um some of the older hiv regimens have been linked to higher levels of some inflammatory markers um some of the uh older boosted protease inhibitors for example <clears throat> were associated with more inflammation than modern uh, integrase inhibitor regimens. Um, and there was a, you know, a study from uh, Spain that suggested that multiple markers of inflammation were lower in uh, uh, INSTE-based regimens than protease. Uh, other studies in the AIDS clinical trials group that compared, say, uh, adazanivir, ritonavir to um, integrase inhibitor regimens did not um, uh, seem to show as uh, significant um, differences uh, in immune activation markers. Some markers were up in, with one drug, but down, and, uh, and other markers were down. Um, and so there wasn't a consistent difference. So I don't, and um, the, so while there may be some very subtle differences between regimens uh, in in um, uh, in some inflammatory markers, uh, those differences are dwarfed, I think, by the differences we see between people with HIV and people without HIV. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that the virus, HIV itself, is a more important driver of inflammation than the drugs are. Uh, that's my general view. Um, um, there continue to be studies, you know, comparing regimen A versus regimen B mm -hmm. in, um, mm -hmm. in inflammation, but 
my my general sense is that they're not you know the there may be some subtle differences but they're those aren't the big you know you know problems uh, uh, drug toxicity is no longer a big uh reason for uh, inflammation in, in in hiv all right because exactly because uh well i i don't know if you basically referred to that spanish study of yours regarding comparing uh 3D art with the 2D, the DR, the, the yeah. two drug regiment versus three drug uh, uh, regiment. So, and plenty of people basically are still uh, questioning this that, that um, if it is actually related with uh, the drug toxicity or not. Uh, well, in this study, you also have the hypothesis that maybe it is because of of HIV hidden reservoirs in the lymph nodes, which you also mentioned in your uh, presentation as well. And of course, I think that it would be very much interesting to see the inflammation markers. Um, in the study that got published some months ago regarding the four days treatment against the continuous uh, treatment. Do you have any update regarding or do you know regarding uh, this study? Oh, four... so uh, what, what was what was the question about four days uh, versus? Uh, exactly. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, well, in case, well, in case, basically, you you I read about that study. So, uh, comparing comparing uh, four days per week. Oh, four days per week. Per oh, I, I see. Week what you're taking yeah, 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 regiments yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Do you have yeah. any any sense, let's say, regarding the inflammatory markers? My yeah, my my um, um, I this study may have been done, and I'm just unaware of it. But I um, um, uh, uh, but if it's um, if it hasn't been reported, I'll tell you what I would predict. Uh, mm -hmm. I would predict that um, um, I would predict that um, a four days a week regimen um, would uh, uh, perhaps maintain. Uh, viral suppression, a clinically undetectable viral load, uh, but might result in somewhat higher levels of inflammation uh, because there, there would be an opportunity for some low level uh, replication to occur, not enough to cause uh, a selection of resistant viruses, but, uh, but enough to cause um, uh, inflammation. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and my, my colleague, um, uh, Jose, uh, uh, Mancio Castilla at um, University of Colorado in Denver has published many studies um, linking uh, 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 lower adherence uh, to HIV medicines to uh, higher levels of inflammation in a variety of contexts, uh, both in Sub-Saharan Africa and in, um, uh, and, and in Europe and in, and in the United States. And so I think that, um, uh, I think that the, uh, um, uh, even in people who maintain a clinically undetectable viral load when they come to get their blood checked, um, there's a range of adherence and, and some people take, you know, more or less of their drugs and his data seem to suggest that there's, there's a difference um, uh, there. So I, w I would expect that four days a week would result in more inflammation. Um, mm -hmm. But, but I haven't seen them um, that that would be a, um, you know, a worthwhile analysis to do, but I, I, I'm not sure if it's been done already, but that's what I would predict. Mm. Hey. And you be, yeah. I, oh. I have to, we have a lot of questions. I'm sorry, Apostle. <laughs> I have to take Thank a few so other much, questions. Thank you so much, Peter. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. you so much, Peter. So we have a lot of questions and I'm hoping we will manage to do some more of them. Uh, first, we have a questions, question about the inflammation. Since it's uh, connected to the X and Y chromosomes, uh, have there been any research done focusing on uh, trans women? And do you know in this, if this uh, group is affected by inflammation? Yeah, so it's, um, it's a really good question. And um, yeah, there, there are several groups that are looking at um, 
the uh, effect of um, uh, uh, gender affirming hormonal therapy uh, on, uh, on, on inflammation. And um, some studies have suggested that some gender affirming um, uh, uh, therapies uh, seem to be associated with increased uh, 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 inflammation in some, some biomarkers, although the, the data are not really consistent. Um, and, and they don't um, uh, across uh, uh, biomarkers, and and the studies um, may not always fully account for confounding risk factors. Uh, you know things like um, uh, a substance use, uh, uh, smoking, et cetera, that may uh, contribute to inflammation. And so they're often comparing a group of you know trans women to cis men, um, and um, uh, but there may be differences between those groups other than the sex hormones that they're trying to measure. So, so I think those studies are are, are being done now, um, but they're not um, they're they're not completely definitive yet. Um, uh, and um, uh, the other aspect of this is important to remember. In one of the slides I showed, um, male uh, cells uh, from uh, um, people who are male sex at birth. Um, do not respond uh, to uh, estrogen in the same way as cells uh, from uh, uh, people who are female, uh, uh, assigned female sex at birth. So there seems to be a genetic uh, and sex hormone interaction. Um, uh, so it, it's not as, um, so estrogens may have a different effect in uh, uh, women who are uh, assigned female sex at birth compared to trans women, um, uh, if that makes sense. And so I, I think this is, these are really important questions and there's a lot of research being done in this area, but we don't, you know, don't yet have definitive answers on it, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it's likely to be different in, in cis women versus trans women. It's really interesting. That, that also makes, um, me wonder like the next question i have is is uh, if is there there is a big difference when it comes to inflammation within the group women living with hiv like the individual differences and uh, and if so why uh the the differences but what, what do you mean between um like in within the group you? women living with hiv are there yes. huge differences when oh, it comes yeah, to inflammation yeah. so, so yeah, so there are lots of things that influence inflammation, right? Um, your, um, you know, the amount of exercise that you do, whether you smoke, whether you drink, you know, um, your 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 weight, you know. Uh, so um, uh, obesity is associated with um, increased inflammation. Uh, so there, and, and then varying disease stage uh, disease stages um, of HIV. Um, so if you um, started ART later uh, in the course of HIV, you'll have higher inflammation. So, so as a whole, women with HIV may have higher inflammation than men with HIV, but there are certainly women with HIV that have low levels of inflammation, you know, who, you know, you know may have started ART at very early disease stages, mm -hmm. you, know, but, you know, healthy, you know, lifestyle and, um, so it's both uh, lifestyle have, factors and, and other yeah, factors. Yeah, so, so there, there, there are lots of, um, yeah, there, there, there are lots of differences. So, there, so not, every, you know, not every woman with HIV has elevated inflammation. It's just on average, um, you know, women with HIV tend to have more inflammation than men. And, and so, uh, oh, good. Oh, I'm sorry, continue. I was just going to say, I mean, uh, eventually when we get, um, uh, uh, inflammatory markers that can be useful in the clinic to risk stratify people who are most in need for interventions to reduce inflammation, you know, then we'll get, have a better sense of, um, of who really, you know, stands to benefit the most from a, a, a statin, for example, or, you know, if treating CMV ends up being an effective strategy, you know, we may have biomarkers that predict who's most likely to benefit from that. Um, that we could use in the clinic, uh, but it's likely that not all women with HIV, you know, are, are, are have the same need for, you know, uh, these interventions. So uh, we have a question here about like symptoms or indications of, of high inflammation. Are there any, like, how do you know you have 
high inflammation in, in your body? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, un unfortunately, there's no clear, like, telltale sign that you have um, uh, in, in inflammation in the, in, in, in the body. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the best way to tell is with these research level, you know, uh, blood tests uh, that, that look for uh, in, in inflammation. But, um, uh, but most of the inflammation that we're talking about, again, I use that example, example of hitting your thumb with a hammer. There you have a lot of concentrated inflammation in one spot and you know it's there, right? It hurts <laughs> and it's red and swollen. But the level of inflammation we're talking about in HIV is is silent inflammation. Mm -hmm. It's much lower level so that you don't, it's not even producing a, a, a symptom. It's just that what we're concerned about is just the low level inflammation uh, persisting for a long period of time that takes its toll gradually on, on the organs. And mm -hmm. so um, unfortunately we don't have, you know, symptoms that, that tip us off that you're, that you have that um, uh, going on. Okay, interesting. Uh, so we also have a question about the hormone replacement therapy. You talked a bit about menopause and uh, uh, read. so do we see any effects on inflammation in women living with HIV when, when using uh, hormone replace, replacement therapy and um, for example, like estrogen patches, is, is that a recommendation to use it or uh, like? Yeah, it's a great, use? it's a great question. And, and we don't have the answer yet. Uh, so based on the biology that I shared with you, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, we, we wonder whether, um, hormone replacement therapy would have anti-inflammatory benefits in postmenopausal women. Um, uh, and in fact, there is a clinical trial that's uh, being developed uh, in the AIDS clinical trials group right now um, uh, to test just that, um, to, t um, to enroll postmenopausal women and, and um, you know, uh, randomize them to um, hormone replacement therapy or a placebo uh, 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 to, to see whether uh, hormone replacement actually decreases inflammation and other symptoms. Um, of course, there are other symptoms that are, you know, uh, you know, hot flashes. For example, when women are going through menopause, that that hormone replacement therapy we know can help with. And so um, there, there's a study in in, in um, development now that hopes to address those questions. Thank you. So I think we have room for, yeah, we have room for at least one more question, maybe two. Uh, so there's a question uh, and I will read it. As far as I understand, working out is always reducing inflammation. Is that correct? If I am an older woman, how should I think about working out? Maybe it's not as easy as it, as it used to be. Yeah, so every bit of exercise is helpful. Um, so even if it's just um, uh, brisk uh, walking, um, even if it's not like running really fast um, um, uh, or using you know, a lot of bulky exercise equipment, um, you don't have to do that to, to have a benefit of exercise. Uh, one of the studies I, I referenced in passing done in Italy, you know, just uh, uh, had people do brisk walking uh, for 20 minutes, um, uh, three times a week. Um, uh, and they measured uh, 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 an effect of um, mm. uh, of, uh, of that level of exercise uh, on on inflammation. And it is true that more aerobic exercise, you know, will reduce inflammation further, um, you know, over time. Uh, so, um, uh, but but even a little bit of exercise is helpful. And and in the aging literature and elderly people without HIV. You know, exercise is like the most beneficial thing you can do beyond any medicine that any doctor could prescribe you. <laughs> exercise has so many benefits um, uh, that help with functional status, with your your, your memory and cognitive function, um, uh, in addition to your physical health. So, okay, well, we're we're running out of time, but I will uh, ask one last question, and that's. Um, Jane in the introduction talked a bit about the intermediate uh, fasting that she had read something 
uh, yeah. about that could reduce inflammation could you just give us some kind of answer to that is it so yeah so so uh, uh so uh, fasting has been um uh, uh uh you know tested uh in in the aging literature to um uh, decrease um uh, aging related complications um uh and so there's some evidence that um uh, that intermittent fasting does you know, um, uh, decrease aging risk in people without HIV. Um, I'm unaware of any data in HIV that, you know, uh, but 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 I should also say that you know exercise is probably far more effective <laughs> than <Right>. um, <laughs> uh, than fasting. Uh, so if you were to choose, I would choose exercise. Um, uh, and and I'm not aware of any data in HIV that suggests that fasting would be um, uh, and, and and more recently, the the, the you know, fast fasting has come into question as to how um, how well it really does prolong longevity, um, and there can be some risks of you know uh, uh, of malnutrition too if you're if you're taking that to an extreme. And so, I always mm -hmm. recommend just a healthy diet and uh, and exercise. Um, okay. Well. Thank you. Uh, I think there were a lot of questions that we didn't have the time for, but I hope we could do this again. Uh, it's obvious that this is uh, a topic that raises many questions and it's super important for so many. So thank you so much, Peter, for being with us today. It was really interesting. And thank you everyone who watched. If you have any questions, you could send them to info at positivagruppen.se and we could also forward them to, to you maybe, Peter. Uh, perfect. And uh, we will uh, publish a summary, and an article about the seminar on our website and also in our magazine. And also we have recorded it and we will put it on our YouTube channel. So it will be possible to watch it after this. And if you know anyone who missed this, you could tip them that, that it's possible to, to watch it online uh, on YouTube. So Great. thank you and good evening and good morning for you, Peter. Okay, bye. good evening. Yeah, yeah, bye.